Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to CMC Markets and me with me, Michael Hewson, and this monthly webinar for the July US non-farm payrolls report. Before I get started, i um, just like to do a little bit of a housekeeping, disclaimers and what have you. I'm going to talk a we're going to talk in great length, I think, today about the numbers, key levels on various markets. Obviously, the um, after effects of last night's uh, last night's tweet 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 by uh, President Trump and the likely impact that the escalation that we've seen in the last 12 to 24 hours is likely to have on global markets in general. And I think the key takeaway that we can um, deduce from Mr. Trump's intervention is that it's not a particularly positive one. We can certainly see that in the way that um, these indices are currently pricing. Looking at the FTSE 100, looking at the S&P 500, um, looking at a significantly lower open for US markets on top of the declines um, that we've seen in the last couple of days. It's, um, it's an extremely disappointing outcome if you're, a, if you're a stock market bull. But to all intents and purposes, markets are looking a little bit stretched, as can be seen from this daily chart that I'm looking at on the S&P 500. Now, I think in terms of the importance of this report, it's probably less important now than it was, say, for example, two days ago when the Federal Reserve cut interest rates by 25 basis points and basically more or less said that um, it was a it was a mid cycle adjustment. Um, so President Trump didn't get his wish for a bigger cut and a weaker dollar. And based on the economic data that we've seen thus far out of the US economy, I think it was just it was difficult to justify um, anything more than a 25 basis point rate cut. So I think from that point of view, um, while one could criticise the Fed's communication, because the press conference was a bit of a shambles, I don't think anyone could really criticise the Fed in terms of the extent of the cut, even though we had two dissents from Esther George of the Kansas City Fed and Eric Rosengren of the Boston Fed, but I always felt that they would dissent in any case. So um, the big question now is, has recent events made a September rate hike, rate hike, September rate cut that much more likely? Well, if we look at my one of my favourite screens, which is WIRP on Bloomberg, we can see that markets are now assigning a 100% probability that we will get a cut in September, on the 18th of September. September the 18th, 100% probability of a rate cut. Now, if we go over to the right-hand column here, we can say that markets are assigning a 90% probability that it will be 25 basis points, um, which I suppose, given recent events, um, it's not unreasonable they're also assigning a 10% probability that we will see a 50 basis point rate cut. Now, at the moment, I don't think that is likely, even though markets are already pricing in the prospect of a 50, point, 50 basis point rate cut. Now, why do I say that? Well, it's very simple. If I look at the US two-year yield, that is currently trading pretty much, and I apologise for the slow response for my Bloomberg, um, it's trading at 1.7%. So that's over 50 points below the upper bound of the Fed funds rate. The Fed funds rate is between 2 and 2.25%. So 1.7%, it's... 50 points, 55 points pretty much below the upper bound for the US Fed funds rate. Um, so we've pretty much got two priced in already based on the moves that we've seen over the past few days. And if we look at the way that chart has behaved, 
um, in the past two days, we've fallen quite precipitously. Um, we haven't been able to really break out of this range that we've been in over the course of the past few weeks. But what, what does appear to be the case is we do appear to have dropped or looking at around this support level around about 1.7%. So that, for me, is a very, very key level going forward. Also, if we look at the 10-year, the 10-year we've seen a significant move lower as well, 1.86%. So that's also a significant move lower in the 10-year US Treasury yield. And that has broken the lows that we've seen at the beginning of July. So markets certainly pricing in a significant rate cut between now, well, in September. Obviously, that will be dependent and contingent on the economic data that we've seen or expect to see coming out of the US economy over the next few weeks. One thing I would say, though, is that in the context of the data, if we get a poor number today, then obviously the odds of a 50 basis rate cut will increase. So what are we looking for? Well, in terms of the headline payrolls numbers, anything in line with the ADP number that we saw earlier this week, 155, 165, is pretty much in line with expectations. Certainly in terms of wages, any significant softening in wages is likely to be bad news. Um, certainly in terms of a more modest rate cut, that will, that will reinforce um, expectations of a much larger cut going forward. One of the things I would say, though, is we did have two dissents in um, the most recent meeting. So the big question is, what's in the context of a September rate cut, what will prompt the two dissenters in July to change their minds in September? And there's two narratives at play here. There's trade and there's the domestic US economy. Now, the domestic US economy continues to look fairly decent. Yes, we had a fairly weak Chicago PMI earlier this week, came in at 44. The ISM manufacturing was a little bit soft and prices paid was very soft. So I think a continuation of weak data, um, it could be a question in terms of a continuation of weak data. It's really a question of degree. Do we get 25? Do we get 50? Um, particularly if Trump follows through on his threat to implement tariffs. Let's not forget, these tariffs come in on the 1st of September. Now, these tariffs are likely to hit Trump's base the hardest because they include um, products that have hitherto recently been excluded from the tariffs um, coverage. So we're talking clothes, apparel, shoes, we're talking toys, we're talking electrical goods. So we're talking a 10% tariff on the sorts of consumer goods that generally Trump's base tends to probably have significantly more exposure to. Um, and that's key because US consumer confidence in July was very, very strong. So if we find that in, in the aftermath of these tariffs, consumer confidence drops off quite significantly, and there's a decent chance it might, then that will really reinforce the prospect of a much bigger rate cut when it happens, or if it happens, in September. So I'm being asked, in general terms, if we get a poor figure today, will markets go up in anticipation of that rate cut? Bad news is good news. Well, under normal circumstances, I would probably say yes, um, that, that is a possibility. But there is also the fact that with a good number, last night's escalation by the president has muddied the waters with respect to the normal reaction function of the market. So you could argue no news is good news, but you could also argue that bad news is bad news because it means the global economic outlook is getting that much darker. Central banks are more likely to ease, but they're pushing on a string. Because if you actually look at what you, what's happening in Europe, there is now more negative yielding debt 
than there ever has been, $14 trillion worth. And irrespective of whether or not we get worse data, profit margins on, particularly in US stocks, are likely to come in. And at some point, you're going to reach a tipping point between valuations and where where stocks really should be. Now, at the moment, we aren't seeing any evidence of a significant meltdown in sentiment. If we look at the way markets have been behaving, we're still very much in an uptrend. So in terms of mentality, very much still in buy the dip mode for stock markets. Finding support on the 50 day moving average for the S&P 500. We're also looking uh, on the FTSE 100 at a similar sort of outlook. If we look at the FTSE 100 over the course of the last few months, we're still very much in an uptrend. But what we've seen on the weekly charts looking to play out at the moment is potential for some significant reversals here. We've got here a very long upper shadow on this candle. If we close all the way down here, there is a decent chance we're going to come back and test the lower bounds of these trend lines that I've been talking about right here right now. So 50 day moving average at the moment. We're right on the cusp of it here. Uh, the next key support on the FTSE is going to be around about 7,360. I do think at the moment we are a little bit oversold heading into the weekend, but that's not to say that this week's events couldn't have a significant dampening effect on sentiment going forward. Just going to pull these over here so that they're out of the way because these are the key numbers that I'm going to be paying particular attention to. Also keep an eye out for any revisions to the June number. But if we look at the, the DAX, that's been particularly hard hit over the course of the last few days. And one thing that is notable is that we've broken the downtrend line from the lows that we've seen in December, which we haven't done on the FTSE 100. So there is evidence of a potential breakdown in terms of risk appetite. We're below the 50 day moving average on the Germany 30, the DAX. We are looking a little bit oversold, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't go quite a bit lower over the course of the next few days. Let's not also forget that next week we have services PMIs, services ISM, services PMIs, and thus far um, those numbers have been generally much more positive than manufacturing. So I think at the moment um, there, there is an expectation, putting all of this trade stuff aside for one moment, that while the global economy is slowing down, it hasn't trickled down into the service sector. Services sector. If it does, then obviously the prospect of a 50 basis, basis point rate cut in September starts to increase. So let's look at the key levels here, because the big question for me is where the dollar goes to next. And at the moment, we've seen a break lower on euro dollar below 111. But what's a, what's a little bit striking here? ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that if we look at the way the dollar index has performed here on a weekly chart, we can see that we've got a very long upper shadow on the weekly chart. It's struggling to maintain these moves higher, which suggests to me it could be vulnerable to a snapback. Uh, the snapback by I mean by that is maybe euro dollar going back through 111.20 back towards 111.80. We have made new two year lows on euro dollar. We can see that here. But this long lower shadow on the daily charts makes me a little bit suspicious. If we break through 111.20, that we could trigger a whole host of stops all the way back up to around about 111.70, 111.80. The dollar is vulnerable to a rebound. And that obviously also applies to cable. Cable has been under pressure like no one else this week. It's above a very, very key support level at around about 119.85. 119.85 is the lows that we saw in 2016 and 2017. We can see it here. It's a huge, huge level. Do not underestimate it. If we don't break that low there, we could experience a very significant rebound. And cable doesn't take any prisoners when it rebounds. I can testify to that having, um, having previously been trading it a few years ago. Cable is a very unforgiving market at the moment. It is looking a little bit soft, but is very much vulnerable to 
a snapback. Looking at dollar yen, it's a similar sort of story. We are at the range lows for dollar yen over the course of the past few days. So we could see if we do get a poor number, if we get a wages number that comes in around about 3%, a weakens to 3%, we could get a little bit of a rebound. Sorry, if we get a if we get a wages number that's better than expected, we could get a little bit of a dollar rebound in dollar yen. Um, you know, we could go we could go either way. As someone just said to me, it looks like a case of managing the chaos, and that's really I think where we are at the moment. We are managing the chaos. We're trying to see the wood for the trees. It's very very difficult to do because of the prospect of a complete tweet out of the blue that sends the markets sharply into reverse and I think that's the real key at the moment we can look as many chart points as we like what we're going to have to do is degree is deal with probabilities and probabilities are at the moment we're above support in dollar yen around about 106 70 75 so we could get a rebound there we're also above some very key support levels in cable but we've broken below a key support level in euro dollar so trading these markets is probably an awful lot more difficult now than it ever has been and it certainly feels that way at the moment we're getting a little bit of dollar yen weakness um, as these numbers come up so i'm going to now be quiet and see where we go from here as these payrolls numbers break okay and here we go average hourly earnings are coming at 3.2 so slightly better than expected um, 3.7 164 in line the revision to the previous month payrolls slightly weaker down from 224 to 193 so I think really what's happened here ladies and gentlemen is that this is a pretty pretty nothing report there's nothing here really to suggest that we are going to see a change of direction and it's really back now to focusing on the trade picture 3.2 wage growth is okay it's not blowing the doors off but the revision lower in the June payrolls report is a slight negative so we are seeing some evidence of jobs growth slowing but certainly not enough to worry anybody and it's really now a question of whether or not next week's services ism starts to show any evidence of weakness in the u.s consumer because certainly in the context of the wages numbers wages are picking up um, headline number is a little bit softer on the average but overall there's nothing in these numbers to suggest that we won't get a potential rate cut in September and the the dollar weakness that we're seeing at the moment is I think a little bit of a reflection of that certainly in the case of dollar yen in the case of euro dollar we're getting a little bit of a squeeze higher looking at 111.20 again on the top side we talked about that earlier I think if we do get a short squeeze through here then we're likely to get a bit of a run up to 50.70 but, but overall, I think it's a bit of a nothing number. Um, in terms of any questions, fire them over because obviously I've looked at Euro Dollar, I've looked at Cable, I've looked at Dollar Yen, um, I've looked at the S&P. I can look at the Nasdaq for those of you who have an interest. Let me just close those boxes there so that uh, we can display the Insights box. If we look at the Nasdaq here also what we've got is a bearish engulfing week so again here there is potential for probably a little bit of a little bit more weakness over the course of the next few days and weeks if this weekly reversal is confirmed what, those of you who are regular listeners to my webinars will know that I look at Japanese candlestick charts an awful lot I think for me they're very very instructive in terms of what they show you in terms of the supply and demand dynamics the buying and selling pressure on any given day I'll take this candle here for example we more or less wiped out the previous 
day's losses at one point yesterday and yet we closed lower that's a very negative it's a very negative look in terms of a market reaction near all-time highs it suggests to me that investors are very very nervous about being long and if we get a break below this support level here which was the lows that we saw on the 9th of July on the Nasdaq we could well see further losses back towards the 50-day moving average I don't try and overcomplicate my technical analysis I try and keep it as simple as I can why because I think keeping it simple um, works better than trying to overcomplicate it um, so the level I'm looking at really on the Nasdaq is around about 7700 this is the Nasdaq 100 I'm going to keep a close eye on that support level simply because it happened to be a fairly decent support there when we broke above this this area of resistance here so keep an eye on that also keep an eye on if we look at the S&P 500 because I'm looking for confirmation here of these numbers and look at the 50-day moving average but also look at a similar sort of low point that we saw around about a month ago two months ago in fact um, these series of lows through here which also happens to coincide with those peaks there if I can just zoom that in you'll see what I'm driving at there's a little bit of congestion through here and through here if you see the way the market reacted around 2960 there was a peak there there was a peak there then there was a trough there there was a trough there there's a trough there we rebounded through there went up we're now below it so 2960 on the S&P is likely to be a very key support level which would potentially bring us back to these peaks here and those lows there so we're looking at 29.10 as the next key support level on the S&P 500 now that we've now that we've staircased lower through this pivot zone around about 2960 so for any potential short positions on the S&P I think really what you're doing here is you're looking to stop out any short position above 2960 because of the importance of that that high there that high there that low there and that low there yesterday so keeping an eye on that being asked about uh, Canada yen and Aussie yen so let's have a quick look at Aussie yen first bring that up right when you're looking at Aussie yen you really do need to be aware that next week we have the Reserve Bank of Australia and they are due to make a decision on Australian interest rates now I've done a little bit of a preview on that you, you'll be able to find it in the news and analysis of the sec, uh, news and analysis section of the website um, around about 4 p.m. today I haven't published it yet but the Aussie's been under pressure quite a bit as you can see from that daily chart that I've got in front of you there um, you got a flash crash low from earlier this year currently below 72 but um, you have to be cognizant of the fact that everyone is expecting the RBA potentially to cut rates next week the RBA rate meeting is on the 6th of August it's Tuesday so Tuesday morning and last week's recovery in quarterly inflation measures might temper the RBA in terms of whether or not they cut rates next week because let's not forget the RBA has already come off the back of two rate cuts one in June one in July are they really going to cut rates again in August when it's not immediately apparent that the effects of a rise in inflation are yet to filter through into the currency and let's not forget a falling currency is slightly inflationary anyway we've also got the fact that RBA Governor Philip Lowe when they eased monetary policy for the very first time in June said that further easing was likely to have little effect particularly if other central banks act in a similar fashion this would suggest 
to my mind that given the declines in the Aussie, the RBA might spring a surprise and stay on hold. So you need to be careful about that. There is a risk the RBA might hold off on raising rates. That doesn't mean that they won't, sorry, raising rates, cutting rates. I keep saying raising rates. Why do I say that? Cutting rates. They might spring a surprise and stay on hold. And that doesn't mean that they won't cut rates later, but they might wait to see the effects of the two previous rate cuts and the decline in the Australian dollar. And obviously there is an awful lot of Aussie weakness there as a result of the US-China trade dynamic as well. So you don't really want to sort of press down too hard on the monetary accelerator at a time when the trade tensions are doing a little bit of your job for you. So be very, very careful with respect to Aussie and Aussie crosses over the course of the next week or so because the RBA could have in its locker a little bit of a surprise. And we are very, very oversold. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't continue to go lower. But if you are short of Aussie or Aussie crosses, lower your stop losses down so that if you do get a sharp rebound, you don't give it all back. Um, when we're looking, looking at the run here, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Aussie's fallen for 11 days in a row. So by the law of probabilities, we're due a rebound. So you need to start pairing back your short positions um, in preparation for a little bit of a snapback. Canada yen. Um, what am I looking at? The lowest point on the Aussie dollar? Well, just I'll come to Canada yen in a minute. Sorry, just answering another question here. Um, very much in a downtrend, as you can see. Let's go back slightly further. We did have the flash crash lows of earlier this year. And that, or the end of last year, and that was around about 67.30, 67.34. If we go back any further than that, you're sort of really looking pretty much, you're looking at a long, long way back, 2009. You're looking at potentially 10 year lows. So um, that's not to say the Aussie can't go an awful lot lower, but I liken this to potentially to possible elastic band effect you can stretch it and stretch it and stretch it but at some point it's going to snap and it's going to hurt you so be very very aware of a snapback on Aussie dollar it could come um, because the market is looking significantly overstretched so a little bit below where we are now around about 67.30 is probably a, a decent area of support in the short to medium term Canada yen um, again, we're looking at um, very key support level around about the lows that we saw around about uh, the end of May, around about 79.90, 80. Nice round number. I like round numbers. They tend to act as fairly decent support and resistance levels. And also we have the Canadian jobs report next week as well. And you also have to basically take into account the fact that Canada, the Canadian dollar is a proxy for crude oil. So those declines that you've seen in the Canadian dollar over the course of the past couple of days have been very much largely driven by the big decline that we've seen in crude prices. So the big question is, I think for me, is not just about what the Canadian economy is going to do because the Canadian economy is actually doing OK. Um, unemployment, um, unemployment fell to a multi-year low at 5.4% in May and wages have started to push higher. So I think even if the Fed does cut in September, that doesn't mean the Bank of Canada will follow it, in which case you could see the Canadian dollar come to a little bit of a bounce. So you've got a combination of weakness in the oil price, which is weighing on Canada, as well as a little bit of yen strength in terms of safe haven buying as well. So key support level around about 80 on Canada yen could make it vulnerable to a bit of a rebound and to, to highlight the fact that we are near a very key support level on Brent crude if we look at my Brent crude chart here this is one I drew earlier um, I've drawn a line through $60 a barrel which is the lows pretty much since early February if we look at the lows in June here and the lows yesterday we got a fairly decent rebound from that key level there. So keep an eye on Brent crude prices. If we get a bit of a move lower on that, 
that could unwind in terms of it could unwind in terms of Canada weakness. Also have a quick look at WTI as well. And for me here we've got a little bit of a consolidation in and around $54 a barrel. A um, little bit of a double bottom there which saw us move higher. Now the key level for me is in and around this $54 a barrel level here. If we can consolidate a move through here uh, then we could see another move lower at the moment. We're getting a little bit of a tweezer bottom and a little bit of a rebound from around about $53.50. So um, keep keep a particular eye on that. If we get a break lower in both Brent and WTI, we could get a follow through effect there. So Aussie Kiwi. Okay, Aussie Kiwi. You can look at Aussie Kiwi. We've also got an RBNZ rate meeting next week as well. So be a little bit careful with Aussie Kiwi. We've got the RBA and the RBNZ reporting uh, their latest monetary policy decisions uh, next week. But the direction of travel here is quite clear for Aussie Kiwi. Aussie Kiwi is falling. We're in a downtrend. We would be looking to sell any rallies back to this trend line here. So you could draw a line through these peaks through here, the 200 day moving average. It looks like we're potentially heading lower on Aussie Kiwi. Always remember the direction of the trend. The direction of the trend, the trend is your friend. I know it's a cliche, but it is so true. Basically, to trade in the direction of the trend, trade in the direction of the market. Let's quickly do gold. Gold is very much a buy the dips. Um, ever since we broke above 1380, I've said this, I think, on our previous two webinars, that we'll trade sideways for a bit before breaking higher. I still stand by that. If you've got bond yields heading lower and lower and lower, then the prospect, the likely prospect is you are going to see gold eventually move higher as a potential store of value. Now, people can say what they like about gold in terms of that it doesn't yield anything. Well, it yields more than $14, 000, $14 trillion of global bonds. So I would suggest you know people who criticise gold um, take a look at that and stick that in their pipe and smoke it because basically 14 trillion dollars of global debt is yielding negative rates that makes gold a much better store of value than all of those other bonds so again if we get a little bit of a drift back anywhere near to 1400 or 1380 while we're above this key support level here then the direction of travel points to a potential move higher towards around about $1,500 an ounce. Well, one more thing before I sign off. Um, we've also got earnings coming out next week for Lyft and Uber. So they should give us a little bit of a volatility, second quarter earnings. Um, and they are due out on the 7th and the 8th of August, respectively. So... Um, Unless anyone else has any other questions, I'm hoping I haven't forgotten anybody or anything. Um, does anyone else have any other questions about... Oh, Dollar Canada and Sterling Yen. Just seen that. Sorry, guys. Let me just do that for you. Dollar CAD, because we do have payrolls reports. The payrolls report. The Canada payrolls report next Friday. Right, so with respect to dollar cad there is a distinct chance that we could be approaching a little bit of a resistance level in dollar cad in and around the 200 day moving average but also coinciding with these lows here if you assume that the canadian economy is going to be slightly stronger than the u.s economy then really you need to be long of cad short of the u.s now at the moment we're getting a strong move higher in dollar cad um, maybe on the basis of the fact that those wage numbers were slightly better than expected and oil prices are a little bit on the soft side. So that could be why the Canada is slightly weaker today um, than it has been over the course of the past two or three days and um, why we're seeing a little bit of a, re a retest of the 200-day moving average. But overall, if we look at the direction of travel here, um, we're, mid we're in the middle of the range and at the moment, there is a distinct possibility we could run out of steam around about the 200-day moving average. Um, what else? Sterling Yen. Sterling Yen is looking 
a little bit soft. We can see that from this sterling yen chart here. I was looking at it the other day and um, it'll be very interesting to see how these lows here match up with the lows that we saw in 2016, 2017. Keep going over here. So we can see we've still got quite a bit to go from the flash crash lows of October 2016 but we have broken below the lows in of earlier this year. So if you if you buy into the narrative that the Japanese yen remains a little bit of a safe haven and sterling is likely to continue to look soft because of fears of a hard Brexit then probably selling rallies in sterling yen is the right way to go. But would I be short these sorts of levels? Probably not. I'd wait for a rebound. And it, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Sterling cable in particular is looking very vulnerable to a short squeeze. It wouldn't take much to snap it back higher. Would I sell at these sorts of levels? Probably not. But I would certainly look for a move back to around about 122.80, 123, um, which coincides with this support level here. This 123.80 level held for quite a long time before it gave way. So the potential for a short squeeze is there at the moment. We're too far away from the support around about 119.80, 120. So at the moment, I'm leaving well alone. I've always got a motto when it comes to trading a particular market. I wait for it to come to me and a level that I'm comfortable buying or selling at. If it's nowhere near a level I'm comfortable buying or selling at, I'll leave it well alone. OK, so that's, I think, it. Euro Swiss. Yeah, dollar Swiss. Don't touch it. I mean, the Swiss is one of those currencies. It's very, very difficult to make money off. I know that. I used to play around with it um, 20, 30 years ago, dollar Swiss. It's very, very tricky. It doesn't move and conform to the same sorts of um, behaviour that like say for example euro dollar does or dollars or um or cable or any of the other currencies do it's also very expensive um certainly looking at the way that it's trading at the moment it's obviously getting a safe haven bid on the back of the fact that um in the same way that the yen is and as a result it's likely to mimic the yen to a greater or lesser extent, which means you're likely to get a move back to around about 98. Now, what does that mean for Euro Swiss? It probably means Euro Swiss is going to go an awful lot lower, but it's obviously then going to elicit a significant response from the Swiss National Bank. They've already got negative rates of 75 basis points. The whole Swiss yield curve is negative. So the big question for me is whether or not Swiss banks and the Swiss National Bank will make it that much more difficult for whether well, they'll loose, loosen financial conditions even more. And the likelihood is that Euro Swiss here, we have it, 109, certainly has the potential to go an awful lot lower. So let's look at the weekly chart. We've broken the 200 week moving average. The next key level for Euro Swiss is 108. And I can't see anything in this chart to suggest that we won't see um, a move down towards that level, particularly if you think that the ECB is going to do more when it comes to monetary easing. And certainly the German bond markets are already pricing in uh, another 20 to 30 basis points of rate cuts from the ECB. If you look at the German two year yield, the German the, the, the ECB deposit rate is minus 0.4. So let's look at the German two year yield. It's minus seven minus 0.78. So there's another 38 basis points of cuts that the market is pricing in for the ECB. So at some point the ECB is going to move in line with the market. The ECB will follow. So there we have it. I can't see bond yields going higher anytime soon. Now that, in essence, should prompt investors to buy into stocks. 
But at the moment, because of all this uncertainty over trade, people are unloading a little bit. They're going into the safe havens. They're going into US treasuries. They're going into yen. They're going into Swiss franc. They're going into gold. And until we get some form of clarity against a president who has a scattergun approach to policy, it's going to be very, very difficult and very, very choppy. So with that passing thought, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. Um, wish you good luck trading. Enjoy your weekend and speak to you all or see you all next week. Thanks very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen.